I don't know if it's been good for you, but I have just, I've really enjoyed being in our series called Streams and learning about different traditions. My worldview has just been stretched so much because of it. And if you haven't been here with us for a while, what we've been doing is we have been studying six of of the dominant Christian traditions that most Christian churches fall in. And each week we unpack one, and then the next week we meet somebody who's an expert in it. And so we started off with the holiness tradition, the virtuous life, and then we talked about the charismatic tradition, the spirit-empowered life, and we talked about the incarnational tradition, the, the idea that we live out our Christianity wherever we are, and we talked about how that, uh, that may be, uh, as a, a stay-at-home mom, that may be your ministry, and that may be your vocatio, your vocation. Um, and so now we're in the social justice stream, and after this we only have one more, then I don't know what we're going to talk about. And the social justice stream, I would say, is probably the most touchy of the traditions. The only one that I would say might rival that is the charismatic tradition. And it's touchy because we're not always clear about what it means to be social justice oriented. And we're not always sure what that looks like in the lens of Christianity. And so I want to start this morning by just giving you a really simple definition for the social justice stream within the context of faithful Christian living. When we're talking about social justice, what we're talking about is a focus on justice and peace in all relationships. It's just that simple. We're looking for justice and peace in all of our relationships, in all of our social structures, and we do so in trying to reflect the peace and the justice that we have and that we get through our relationship with Christ. And this this compassionate way of living really addresses the gospel imperative of equity and magnanimity for all people, for all folks. I'm a bit of a history buff. Uh, You should know that by now. I really really like history, and I find it... um, People, you know, people look at, at, at me and they decide sometimes what they think I am and what they think I like or, or whatever, what they think about me. And so often on planes, people look at me funny because I'll put on the Elizabeth movie or I'll put on, you know, uh, some old historical movie. And it's just always funny. The person sitting next to my, you know, to my right or my left, they're always like, what are you watching? So... Um, This morning, I want to start off our conversation talking about a man named John. And I want to talk about him uh, for a couple different reasons. I want to talk about him because I believe he is one of the most contemporary social prophets to advocate for the powerless, one of the most contemporary of those social prophets. And I want to talk about him because he dealt substantially with issues like racism, like consumerism, like militarism. I want to talk about him this morning because he brought the power of divine love directly into the fray of one of the most volatile of of our social issues that we've ever experienced in this country. And I want to talk about him because he labored kind of right smack dab in the middle of raw humanity and did so with such skill and such wisdom in a way that we don't really see as much today. So I, I want to talk about him this morning, and then I want to talk about what social justice looks like for us. Let's pray really quickly. Father, in Jesus' name, help me out this morning, Lord. Uh, I want to do well. I want to be precise, God. I want to be spirit-led, God. I want folks to really get what I believe you're sharing with us this morning. So speak to all of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, so this is John, 
And John uh, was a Quaker man. He was born in 1720, and he was born on a modest New Jersey farm. I always have a lot of respect for people that come from farming because farming is hard, and I couldn't do it. I just could not be a part uh, of farming. I'm a, I'm a little bit too lazy. I have an attitude about having to slice vegetables, uh, so the idea of growing them is just not for me. But it is said that John, even as a child, was exceptionally sensitive to the Spirit of God and sensitive to matters of the Spirit. In an early journal entry, he wrote, before I was even seven years old, I was being acquainted with the operations of the divine. And at the age of 21, like most young adults, he realizes it's time to fly out of the nest. It's time to get ready to go. Uh, Ayala, you, you're creeping up on 21. In a minute, you're going to get out. And uh, John was ready for that. And so he went and apprenticed himself out to a shop owner. And in working at this shop, he really developed his skills as a tailor, uh, but also as somebody who could draft legal documents. He was like a 17, you know, 1700s um, notary. And it was during this time that he had his first kind of experience with slavery when his employer told him, I need you to draft a bill of sale for an enslaved person that I'm selling. And this bothered John. It, it, I mean, it vexed him. And he told his employer, he said, I don't believe that the keeping of slaves is consistent with the Christian religion. And this was kind of the beginning of what would be a lifelong mission for John. Over the next few years, he uh, eventually took over the tailor shop that he worked at, and um, he was fairly successful. I mean, it, it brought in a lot of income. But he soon realized that for as big as the business was, he was not able to focus on ministry the way he wanted to. It kind of ties into the incarnational tradition where we see that, again, what makes your money may not be your life's purpose. Amen? And so he, he realizes this, and he decides to pare down the business so he can focus full-time on ministry, and he starts traveling and preaching to Quaker churches. And one of his ministry trips took him to the South. And this was the first time that he had really come face to face with the barbarous and diabolical and demonic structure of slavery. And when we talk about slavery, I'm talking about the transatlantic slave trade. There are a lot of different slaveries in our history. We want to be specific. And he described it, he said, it was like a darkness gripped the land. And what blows my mind is that more than a hundred years before the Civil War, John was able to see prophetically that slavery was going to be an issue that this country was going to wrestle with for generations to come. Generation after generation, he recognized that the consequences of slavery were going to extend even past actual slavery. And and so this really became the focus of his ministry, the abolition of slavery. And what's interesting about John is that he had incredible success with convincing slave owners to release their slaves, more so than any other abolitionist of his time. He, there was something about him that he was able to get people to see the error of their ways. And I think it was because he was really gifted in being balanced with being both tough and gentle. That's not a combination a lot of us are good at. It. When I'm tough, I'm just tough. I ain't got no gentleness. And, and when I'm gentle, I'm often a little too soft and I'm not pushing hard enough. But John was real good at doing both of them. And not only did he really advocate for the abolition of slavery, but he lived this out. He would refuse to use um, products that were uh, produced from slave labor. This meant he didn't have any sugar. This meant that his bread had to come from somewhere else. This meant that he didn't have clothes that were made out of the cotton and he didn't even have the, the, the dye that you would use to dye clothes. What this meant was that his family looked raggedy and often didn't eat well. He was known for speaking powerfully about slavery uh, and, and, and again using both his words and his actions. There's a story about him in uh, 1758 
he was preaching at this Quaker church about the abolition of slavery. And like most Christians, after services, they went and did what? They went to eat. They went and had dinner at the pastor's house. And he walks into the pastor's house and he notices servants and he inquires about their status. Are they slaves? The pastor says, yeah, they're slaves. And without another word, he gets up and he walks out of the room. He walks out of the house. He does not explain and he does not come back. That silent testimony was so convicting for the owner of the home, Thomas Woodard, that the very next morning, he freed all his slaves, every single one of them. So this was the effect that um, John had on people. And at some point, John realized that it was not enough for him to just not support slavery himself, but that he really had to take that next step. And in 1754, there was a, a fierce battle that broke out as an offset of the French and Indian War on the Pennsylvanian um, frontier. And as a result of this, John urged the Quaker church, he said, we need to pull out of this Pennsylvania government because we cannot support this bloodshed. We cannot support the overtaxing of the people for this war. We have to pull out. And so the Quaker church, their community that calls themselves Friends, the Friends pulled out of the Pennsylvania General Assembly but what this did for them was that this forced the Quaker church to search for new avenues to communicate their moral concerns because they no longer had a seat at the government table. And John really used this moment to capitalize on his abolitionist agenda. He handed out pamphlet after pamphlet, gave sermon after sermon. Uh, in 1754, he published uh, a document called Some Considerations on the keeping of Negroes recommended to the professors of Christianity in every denomination. No anti-slavery document prior to this had had as much circulation as this did or the impact as it did. He was so clear in his message, the complete and utter and immediate abolition of slavery. And again, he was just so scared skillful in communicating this message that it would literally disarm slaveholders. He would speak to slaveholders and they would weep. They would cry listening to his message and he would tell them that anything other than freeing the slaves was antithetical to the development of the future society and anti antithetical to Christ. And so he campaigned in this vein for another six or so years writing and speaking and advocating. And eventually, the London Quakers added their voice and their authority to his cause, and they offered an uncompromising stand on slavery. And uh, as he preached more, more and more Quaker leaders were converted over to this idea that everybody is free and everybody is equal, and John's movement really started picking up speed. Then in 1758, stay with me, y'all. We're going to do a little more history diving. In 1758, at the Philadelphia yearly meeting um, sessions, kind of their national conference, the Quaker church um, really had a turning point. And there was an emotional and intense conversation uh, among Quaker leaders about what their position was going to be on slavery, and there were various compromises uh, thrown out onto the floor to be considered. Uh, they, they thought about how can we avoid conflict, or how can we avoid division, or how can we avoid profit loss, um, and still do the right thing. And it is said that John sat through these meetings in absolute silence with his head down, and it is said that he cried the entire time. And finally, when he rose to speak, this is what he said. <clears throat> he said, my mind is led to consider the purity of the divine being and the justice of his judgment. And herein my soul is covered with awfulness. Many slaves on this continent are oppressed, and their cries have entered into the ear of the Most High. Such are the purity and certainty of his judgments that he cannot be partial in our favor. 
In infinite love and goodness, God has opened our understandings from one time to another concerning our duty toward this people, and it is not a time for delay. Should we neglect to do our duty, waiting for some extraordinary means to bring about their deliverance, God may, by terrible things in righteousness, answer us in this matter. The effect of his message was staggering. It was so profound that in response to his message, the yearly meeting, this is hundreds and hundreds of Quaker leaders representing the Quaker church at large, without one single dissent, chose to remove slavery from its midst. midst. This was a decisive step that no other religious body, not the Catholics, not the Lutherans, not the Methodists, not the Presbyterians, no other body had taken, as a matter of fact, not just religious bodies, no other body at all had taken this kind of dramatic step and universal action against the institution of slavery. And due to the compassionate energy of John and others, Quakerism freed itself from slavery by the time the English colonies had um, declared their independence from England. And what's crazy is not one other anti-slavery abolitionist or revolutionary leader, not Washington, not Jefferson, not Patrick Henry, None of them were willing to take that kind of step. They would say, slavery is wrong, but we're not going to free our slaves. The Quakers took this step voluntarily. And what we have to remember is that this action was not only bold, it was expensive. For most of the Quakers who owned slaves, to release them meant all of a sudden there's a lot of labor that has to be done by somebody else. But the Quakers took it a step further. The Quakers said not only are we going to free all of our slaves as a national body, but if you own slaves, those slaves that you free, you need to reimburse them for their time. So you think about what it costs to pay somebody who's been working maybe since they were born maybe since they were born on your field, to pay them. So what this meant was that most Quakers went bankrupt. Most Quakers went bankrupt, and most Quakers had to migrate to the north. Because what we recognize is that compassionate living will always cost you something. It is always a sacrifice. Even Jesus, God, when he decided to save us, did it in a way that cost him something. By now, you, you might recognize that the John I'm talking about is John Woolman. And so much of our understanding of his life has come from his personal journal, which was published in 1909 and is actually, um, it's a Harvard classic. It's, it's now a Harvard classic. And it is considered one of America's greatest spiritual um, written works. Ralph Waldo Emerson said that he had not read anything with as much wisdom in it uh, outside of reading the apostles' literature. And so this is John. This is, this is an example of somebody who led a compassionate life, a social justice life. So the question is, how do we today define a social justice tradition, a social justice life in the context of our Christianity. And the focus of social justice living really has to um, be found in Matthew 22, verses uh, 37 through 40. Pull those up for me, Emma, if you will. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest of the commandments. We've gone over this. This is the Shema. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And all the law and all the prophets hang on these two commandments. When we think about social justice, this is what we need to think about. Jesus doubled down on this idea when he told the story of the Good Samaritan 
of the person who walked by, the person who was his enemy and saw him in need and helped him. And he, he doubles down on this idea of a nigh bore, neighbor, nigh near bore, neighbor, the person who was nearest, the person who was in need. And what's mind blowing about Jesus is that he puts no walls, no boundaries around this idea of neighbor. Then he takes it a, a step further in the Sermon on the Mount, and he says, love your enemies. That's, that's, that's the hard one. It really is. It sounds cute, but it's hard. Love your enemies and, and pray for those who persecute you. This is, I mean, this is really an idea that most people can't handle. It really is. It's an idea that most people can't handle. It is a foreign concept to you. It takes a special type of person to even want to love their neighbors. I mean, their, their enemies. And I've taught before that the order of the Matthew scripture matters. It shows us that the vertical movement of love is essential for the horizontal movement of love. It's why he says, love God with everything you got. And then love your neighbor. Because if we, can't, if we don't love God, we can't love our neighbor. So when we find ourselves in places where it's real hard to love somebody else, that is an indicator, I need to spend some more time with God. Loving on God. Asking God to give me a love for himself. Love of God makes love of neighbor possible. The social justice tradition of Christianity is constantly calling us to the right ordering of society and to the right ordering of relationships. It envisions a social order of things as God has designed it, as God would have it to be, where we are all brothers and sisters in Christ at the feet of Jesus. That's God's dream for his world. And the social justice tradition of Christianity really increases our ecclesiology, right? Our doctrine of the church. It helps us make our faith real and not just theoretical. It, it, it helps us to really um, live into the great commission of going out and making disciples. It puts faces and hearts to what we read in Galatians 3, 25 through 29. It says, but now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian, for in Christ Jesus you are all children of God. Through faith. When you see somebody as a child of God, it changes the way you look at him. Because your daddy is the king. So you're not supposed to be down here struggling like this. You're not supposed to be down here facing injustices like this. You're not supposed to be down here hungry like this. The text says, as many of you uh, were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ, there is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male or female for all. All of you are one in Christ Jesus, and if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. The social justice stream of Christianity promotes this idea of harmony, right? And harmony creates spaces for healthy relationships. It is the design of God. It teaches us that we can be infinitely diverse and still be in harmony. That's the definition of harmony. Two different notes, same piano. The social justice tradition helps us bridge our personal ethics with social ethics. And often we try to separate those two things and it's a disaster. If we faithfully read our Bible but support public policy that's racist in nature, we are a scandal to the gospel. If we preach about a loving God, a providing God, and then aren't willing to do our part to provide for somebody that we don't really have an obligation to, we are a scandal to the gospel. And the hardest thing about the social justice tradition is that it's not passive. It's not passive. It doesn't allow you to just participate in a lazy manner. 
It pushes us to be proactive and intentional. It gives relevance and even, even bite to the language of love that encompasses our faith. Too often, our conversation about love is just sentimental. Oh, Jesus loves you. Oh, he loves you. Oh, yes, he just, he just loves you. Our language about love is theoretical. We sing a song, uh, we sang it here called Reckless Love. David has led it, Peter has led it. I think Diamond and maybe even Mama has, has led it too. And there's a lyric in the song that says, there's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. And we sing that song in churches all across America and do not live it. The love of Christians has so much opportunity and not just opportunity but it has mandate for us to manifest that kind of love in places where people are homeless in places where women are not paid equally, in places where immigrants are seeking refuge, in places where prostitutes need help getting off the street, in places where racism is a reality, and we have to meet that darkness with a love that is not docile, but that screams, this is not the design of our God. This is not the will for his people. This is not God's dream. This is not the gospel. We cannot speak with integrity about this love of Jesus if we're not willing to face institutional and structural ways that the enemy, that Satan tries to devour this earth. Christianity points to a new heaven and a new earth. And this is not something we can sit back and say, well, we'll, we'll, we'll just wait till it comes. One day Jesus will fix it all. That is spiritual laziness and it's unacceptable. We have to say, I believe in the dream of God so much that I'm willing to live into it, to do everything I can to live into it right now. And while it may seem like this world will never be perfectly equitable, the social justice stream of Christianity dares us to believe in a God who can call forth the impossible and make it material. The truth is this is hard. It's easier said than done. It was hard for Jesus. It's why in the Garden of Gethsemane, he wrestled with what he was going to have to do to bring social justice to us. It is why he said, let this cup pass from me, God. But then he follows up that prayer. He says, nope, your will be done. Social justice is living into the idea that God's will is to be done. And when we look at John, we see that it, it does cost. Bankruptcy is real. We see Jesus living into this tradition all the time in our Bible. When, when we look at stories like the woman with the issue of blood being low and reaching out and grabbing him and he feels her need. Where, who, who touched me? Somebody's in need. That's social justice. When we see Jesus feed the 5,000 before preaching, recognizing that they were hungry, they don't care about your Messiah if they're hungry. And he feeds them. That's social justice. We see Jesus always healed before he corrected. When we look at the woman that was about to be stoned, the woman caught in the act of adultery, the first thing that he does is he saves her life. Don't y'all throw no stones at this woman. He stands in the gap. People don't realize that the people were such, um, so easily incensed, if they wanted to, they could have stoned him. In that moment, get out of the way. He saves her life and then he corrects her. Don't do that anymore. We see him being in spaces with the least. 
This is why he was such a threat to the Pharisees, because if his gospel was true, if it was true that everybody could be saved, if it was true that everybody was included, well, that would mean that the Pharisees weren't special anymore, wouldn't it? Each tradition has um, incredible strengths. And also it has some weaknesses and the social justice stream is not exempt from those weaknesses. I just want to talk a few minutes about those weaknesses. One of the weaknesses of the social justice tradition that we have to be mindful of as we're trying to live into it is that there is a tendency for social justice tradition to become an end to itself. Where it becomes the whole idea. When you think about how the needs of poverty are so immediate and the needs of justice are so great, these needs can consume all of our energies and in the face of spiritual realities which are often less pressing and not as loud, uh, social justice can be the only thing that we focus on and we can do social justice concerns or issues meet social justice needs just because they're needs and not out of a place of spiritual realities. As believers, our attachment to meeting the needs of social justice issues has everything to do with our spirituality. We don't feed people just because they're hungry. We feed them because we recognize it's not God's desire for you to be hungry. It's not God's design for you to starve. We fight racism not just because it doesn't feel good, but because this is not, God's design is not for us to be separated and mistreat each other. So when we're doing social justice work, the Christian lens is the why. Why do we do it? Because we look at the example of Jesus and we look at the design of Jesus and anything that lives outside of that, we can't support. Anything that steps outside that, we have to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's not my gospel. I can't stand for this because it's not my gospel. A second issue that we see a lot in social justice streams of Christianity is that it's easy to become, here we go, too attached to a political agenda. It's easy for us to allow ourselves to be co-opted by a political agenda because it aligns with some of the things that we like. Don't get me wrong, our faith is political. It is, it always has been. Christianity is a political space and we do get to make value judgments on political happenings, but we have to be mindful to not be hijacked by any political persuasion or any political agenda. Our commitment is to the person of Jesus. Our commitment is to that relationship and that relationship, not the rules, not the laws, not the morality, that relationship influences how we move in political spaces. And we have to recognize that the state is the best suited for meeting people's needs. And so our job is to tell the state, meet folks' needs. Our job is to set a moral standard. And we get that moral standard solely from our relationship with Jesus. It's really easy to see social justice issues as too big for us, too big for our little efforts, too big for our little resources. And, and there's some truth to that. But there are some things that we can do. I want to tell you a few of them. The first thing that I would encourage you to do in trying to live into the social justice aspect of Christianity is to be open to the possibility that maybe God wants to use you. How about that? That maybe God, we see in history and biblically people over and over again who God used in such significant ways, in so much bigger ways than they imagined. Moses was minding his own business in the desert, had settled down with a wife and some children and a good paying job when God said, go back to Egypt and deliver these people. These people who didn't even like him. As Christians, we need to be open to the possibility that God may want to use us in really incredible ways. 
Next, we need to be informed people. Christians have a tendency to step outside of being aware because sometimes being aware is painful. Sometimes knowing what people deal with is painful. It is much easier. I just want to come to church, have a good cup of coffee, go home, deal with my own wife and children, my own bills, and that's all I have the capacity for. But as believers, our job is to know what's going on. Our job is to get information, to get the facts, if for no other reason than to be praying. How are you praying for folks if you don't know what they're dealing with? That's why we do prayer every week. We get to live into this idea of being global citizens and to care enough about the world that God so loved that he sent his only son for. We get to care about that world, and that means being in relationships. That's hard to be in relationships with folks who are so different than you. I want to tell you a quick story. It's kind of a funny story. When we were in South Africa, we had done our presentation, and uh, two other groups had gone after us. And the MC, I was telling Debbie and her husband last week, the MC, he's, uh, you know, this Zulu man, and he's got kind of a heavy accent. And, and Zulu people kind of talk kind of rough. They kind of, they talk kind of gruff. And so he says in the mic, I want to talk to America's leader. So Andy, good, white, blonde, blue-eyed Andy, comes running up to the front, and the Zulu man says, I want to know why you take our people. Andy freaked out. I freaked out. I'm like, oh, my gosh, my poor white friend is up there, and he's asking him about slavery. Oh, my God, what's going to happen? So Andy's kind of stumbling. So me, in panic, I run on stage. I take the MC's mics, both of them. I toss them into the audience, and me and Andy walk off the stage <laughs> to an audience that's like, what just happened? They were speaking other languages, but I know what they were saying. What in the heck just happened? What? I don't understand. After the, the, the performances, we went and talked to the MC again. And he explained to us that what he was asking is, what is it about America that, that you guys are so willing to accept refugees and people from around the world? What is it about you guys that makes you such a melting pot? That's what he was trying to ask. But there was a language barrier, there was a cultural barrier, there was a context barrier. We didn't understand. That's what I mean when I say being in a relationship with people is hard. <laughs> I took that man's mics and threw them into the audience. I don't know why I did it. It was a panic moment. I was trying to help my little poor friend who was in the middle of a thousand people being asked about why we took slaves. It's hard to be in a relationship with other people. It is, but it is your mandate. If your whole community looks like you, votes like you, acts like you, spins like you, it's time to go out and make some new friends. I, I love the diversity of my community. I have such a diversity of community. I was telling Kiara, I don't know how we're gonna do a wedding. I said, all these different types of people, I have, fr I have friends that carry guns and sell drugs. I have fr friends from the church and I have friends from different types of churches and I have, I don't know how all these people are gonna, what are we gonna feed everybody? What about my friends who don't eat meat? What about my friends who for religious reasons don't eat this or don't eat that? Pray for us. <laughs> About to cut this list down. So in trying to be social justice advocates, we expand our community, and we do so on purpose. One of the people who models this well, I think, is David. David built a relationship with our brother Harold. Where's Harold? I don't even see Harold anymore. Did Harold walk out? Well, anyway, he built a relationship with Harold, somebody that was very different, not just in skin color, but in experience and lifestyle. We expand our circles. The next thing that we do is we support organizations and people that are doing relief work. Support those organizations, do it financially, but also show up and volunteer. I've talked about this before. Judy dragged me down there to, to, to Lowe's and Fishes to wash the feet of, of the homeless. It sounded real noble until I got there. 
I said, we got to, what, what if we just go get them really nice socks? What if we just, what if we not, well, I'll get shoes. Nope, wash their feet. And it's important that we are not lazy with our support of these agencies. Some of us will say, well, I just give $100 and to, to FEMA and I did my part. That's laziness. Again, real social justice in a Christian lens is costly. It costs you something. The next thing that we can do is we can use our gifts. Our gifts as singers and writers and painters and whatever you're gifted in and figure out how does your gift make someone else's life better? Maybe the gift that you have is access to somebody who has some power. Maybe that's your gifting. Maybe whoever shows up at your Thanksgiving table has influence and you can say, listen, Uncle Bubba, that little joke right there, it doesn't work for me anymore. That's not all right. And I know that when you go back to your job where you run this company, that idea permeates what you're doing there. I want you to do better, Uncle Bubba. Maybe that's what you can do. And lastly, and perhaps most, most importantly, we pray. We pray for real. We lay on our face for folks who are not experiencing equity. For folks who are not experiencing God's kingdom as he would design it. We pray even when we don't understand the experience. We lay on our faces for folks. If there is nothing else, if you can't do anything else, you can tarry for some folks. The Bible says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places. The truth of that is actually really freeing because it means that I don't have to be mad at any one person. I can call you out and tell you you're wrong and still love you and invite you over to dinner. My fight is with the devil who tries to use people to harm people. One, I, don't, I, don't, I refuse to participate in that system. And two, I'm determined to tear it down. Here's the truth, church. God calls us to a life of social justice. It's for you. It's not for them over there. It's not for that church down there. It is for you. It is a mandate. It is a part of the gospel. You cannot have Jesus apart from social justice. It's just not possible. And so I want to encourage you to believe so fully God's dream for this world that you're willing to give everything you have, including habits, beliefs, ideas, patterns, comfort, convenience. It's why God told that man when he said, Lord, what do I have to do? Am I a good enough Christian? He told the man, sell everything you have. Some of us have to sell everything that we have, and it is not monetarily, and it is not material items that we have to sell. I want to encourage you to believe that the love of Jesus really does include all people. Poor people, rich people, black folks, white folks, gay folks, stray folks, men and women. It says all of you are included when God said, I so love the world. I want you to take just, I'm just going to give you 30 seconds. And I just want you to just close your eyes. And I just want you to ask God, right now in this moment, what does it look like for me to participate in your social justice? What does it look like for me to bring the reality of heaven to this world? Just take 30 seconds. I'm just going to be quiet and ask.
Whatever it is that God tells you, whenever it is that he tells you, do what he says. Whatever that looks like, do what he says. Let me pray for you. Father God, in Jesus' name, Lord, this is an intense subject. It's a tough one. It's one that can be heavy, God. But Lord, we live into the reality that you are the greatest advocate. You are the greatest lawyer. You are the greatest social justice warrior. And God, all of our responsibility is just to follow you. Help us to do that, Lord. Help us to love the world the way you love the world and its people the way you love its people, God. Help us to live that love out in tangible, real ways that bring equity and agency and equality to all kinds of people, that bring resources and support to all kinds of people in all kinds of situations, God. Fill our heart with just an overwhelming just desire to see your new heaven and your new earth start now. Convict us of that, God, and encourage us in it, God. Lift us up that even today we would leave inspired and full, not heavy and sad. Because the reality is, God, you bring justice. And all we have to do, all we have the privilege of doing is looking to you to see what you're doing and how you would have us participate Show us that in Jesus' name. Amen.